you have to decide for yourself, was this just a coincidence? Was it some happenstance that happened? Or is this something more? And for me, now that I can look back on it, this is down in my gut. And when I say, whoa, wait a minute, it's, it's just not setting right. There's something more here. That's when I look at it and say, it's a sign. Hey everyone, and welcome back to Shifting Dimensions. I'm your host, Jimmy Moses, and thank you so much for tuning in. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Kevin Hall. Kevin is an author, and he recently released a new book called Signs, The Veil is Thinner Than We Imagine. Kevin, thank you so much for stopping by Shifting Dimensions. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you, Jumi. I'm really looking forward to our discussion today. I just wanted to start off by talking about the sign I had before we actually got to have this conversation. And that is a couple of days before you reached out to me, I had this thought pop into my head. I was like, I need to have someone on the show who is focused on signs where I could have a whole hour conversation talking about signs and synchronicities that are all around us, but we might not be privy to or pay enough attention to. And a couple of days later, after having that thought, you reached out to me. So I think, you know, talk about a sign, right? And talk yes. about rapid manifestation. Yes. So I'm excited to um, jump in and talk all things signs. And I want to start off by asking you, did you receive a sign to write this book? And if you did, what was it? Well, the direct answer is yes. But let me uh, step back for a moment and say that signs are all about us. And it's a matter of how open we want to be to receiving them. And I'm not talking necessarily about a religious aspect of it. I'm talking more of a spiritual aspect. And when you were in high school, let's say in science class, be it uh, earth science, physics, what, whatever the science was, did you? if you talked about energy, the question becomes, can you destroy energy? And the real answer is you can't destroy it. You can change its shape. You can change the container that it's in, but you can't destroy the energy. So then it has me thinking, where does that energy that we have, because we're electrical energy, where does that go upon our death? And I'm not afraid of death maybe a little concerned about the way I die, <laughs> but not afraid of death because I know there is a her hereafter. And then that gets into the signs that I've had. And I've had several close uh, relations, parents and friends pass away, and I have received signs from them. And to the point, it's undeniable. Um, I'll give you an example, and I write about it in the book. My brother, we were close and he passed away uh, just before his 59th birthday. Uh, he had a heart valve issue. And what we uh, found out afterwards was that may be hereditary in the family. And I've been to the cardiologist and sure enough, I've, I've got the same thing, but I'm under cardiology care where he wasn't at the time. And after his death, uh, I was kind of chartered with handling all of his affairs. And one of the things was to take care of his possessions. And I had received a little novelty gift of his. It's called The Final Word. And it came from Spencer's Gifts. Uh, you're probably a little too young to remember that. It was in the mall. Um, but Spencer's Gifts had a lot of uh, interesting things, black light posters and that kind of thing. Um, but this gift, uh, that I received, when you press the button, it would say things like stupid jerk, idiot, and, you know, four sayings along those lines. It was mainly meant to break up during a conversation and have some fun with. Well, I worked out of my office the last uh, several years of my career, and you can see the uh, uh, cabinet behind me there, the, the shelves, and I had this device sitting on there. And I'm working away, and it's about 10 o'clock in the morning. All of a sudden, stupid jerk. It just went off. And I remember every time I would go over to my brother's house, he would have that queued up to say, as soon as I walked in, stupid jerk. 
And that was just kind of our thing and we would laugh about it. So I tried everything I could to get that device to go off. I dropped it on the floor. I put it on the shelf. I wiggled the shelf. I jumped up and I could not get that thing to go off. What caused it to go off? So I finally said, Butch, and that was his name. Uh, Butch, are you having fun with me today? And that was all I need to kind of set me at peace, to know that he was still there, that everything was fine. And since then, Jumi, there's another thing I talk about in the book called visitation dreams. And I've had visitation dreams where he has come to me and we just have a great time talking and chatting. And I can recall the full dream, what he's wearing, how he looked, how he smelled, everything about the dream because it was so real. And that's usually a major indication of a visitation dream. Regular dreams, most of them you forget about before you wake up in the morning. And if somebody is, was to say, what was your dreams about? I don't know. Visitation dreams are very vivid, very much like you were there with the person. And a lot of folks, when they pass away, before they do, they wind up having what's called the visitation dreams of dead relatives. Some have them of their pets that have passed on. Uh, some have them of other people that say, get ready. It's not your time, but it's coming. And we had the honor, but also the misfortune of seeing both my mother-in-law and my mom pass on and being with them as they took their last breath. And I will tell you, last breaths are just as important as first breaths. Don't miss the opportunity. It's going to be hard, but be there with them. And before my mom passed on, she told me she had dreams of her second husband. My dad passed on very early in life, and my mom got married later on in life. And she said her second husband, Louis, came to her and said, get ready. It's not time just yet, but it's coming. My mother-in-law had very similar dreams. There's a Dr. Kerr in Buffalo, New York. Dr. Kerr is the CEO of hospice and palliative care in Buffalo. And he has chronicled over 1,500 deaths of his patients, and he's done it in both written format as well as video format, and of course, all with their permissions. And without doubt, there's probably around 80% of them that have these visions. And I had the fortune of talking to Dr. Kerr, and I was asking him a lot of questions about this. And I said, could you tell me who are the people that they typically see? And they said it's typically loved ones, typically relatives. In some cases, it is animals. There was a young lady out there who passed on, and she actually had her dog come to her. And she also saw that she was going to go to this big castle in the sky. Now, again, not trying to get religious, but if you understand it from that perspective, Christ said, I will build this and there will be rooms for everyone. And, you know, I am Christian, but I don't want to just limit this to Christianity. In studying and researching for this book, I looked upon uh, Jewish text. I, I looked upon a Buddha text. I, I went into China, Japan, India. Uh, I, I looked at all everything I could find, the American Indian, um, anything I could find. I went back to the Druids, the um, Egyptians, the, the uh, Roman Empire. Uh, I looked at everything. It transcends time. It transcends cultures. It transcends countries. And I, I'm left with the, with the belief there is definitely a hereafter. And some of the stories of the folks I talked to uh, for interviews and in, uh, to, to write their stories in the book, they're just phenomenal. And trust me, we're going to get into the different stories because one thing you did very well in the book is kind of break down into different categories 
the different types of signs. And we're yes. going to talk about that. But just to kind of summarize everything you just talked about, it sounds like throughout your life, you've been receiving signs, right? Reading through yes. your book, numerous signs, especially from loved ones who've passed away. And even in moments, I think there was a point in the book where you were going to visit your um, father-in-law and it was a snowstorm, I believe. And you and your wife both had the sign that you guys need to stop for the night, rest, and mm -hmm. you couldn't understand why, but you listened to that sign and later found out that if you had kept going 15 minutes into the ride, you would have been met with a, you know, terrible accident, right? So it seems like you've been receiving so many potent signs throughout your whole life. And it seems like that must have been part of the inspiration for you to want to write this book, correct? That That is correct. And, and all these signs I had been thinking about for a while, and the final one, it culminated in a visit that we had with my very, very good friends. In fact, uh, they just lost uh, his wife due to ovarian cancer. It just happened within the last two weeks. Um, we had them up for a visit. And we were sitting down playing dominoes. And my wife, when she's playing dominoes or just thinking, she'll fiddle with her earring. You know, she'll just grab it. It's just a kind of a habit and fiddle with it. Well, during the game, the earring came off from its backing and fell. So she got up and she started looking around, couldn't find it. Well, a few minutes, I said, okay, let's just halt the game for a little bit and help her find it. So we all got up and we looked around. We could not find this earring, no matter how hard. I mean, we're sitting at the kitchen table. How hard is this? So she goes to bed that night and she shakes out her clothes. She brushes her hair. No earring. Next morning, we all gather downstairs for breakfast. We're eating at the island now instead of the kitchen table, but at the kitchen island. And we're getting ready to go out for the day. After we ate, we wiped down the island put away the dishes and stuff, and then headed out the door. Around five o'clock that night, we came back in and I was the first one in walking into the kitchen from the back hallway, my wife and my buddies in, in single file. And also my wife goes, honey, you found my earring. I said, whoa, time out here. I just got here. I didn't find anything. She points to the island and there was the earring sitting on the island. Now, uh, a little bit of a backstory, that earring had been a gift. And she was so happy to have found the earring. My buddy's wife, the one who just passed, looked at it and said, wait a minute, we just wiped off that whole island this morning. There was nothing on it. How did that earring get on the counter? So she takes from her purse a little cardinal charm, eh, maybe three quarters of an inch. And she places it down where the earring was. And she told us that she too has had some of these kinds of experiences. And then putting the cardinal charm on there was her way of kind of embracing the spirit and, and bringing a little uh, good luck or acknowledgement, if you will, to the situation. And after that, I said, that's it. I, I've got to write this book. And there's just too many of these and then the folks I interviewed and their stories that I put within the book uh, uh, Jumi I mean I, I just can't tell you all that it kept pulling me in further and further and a lot of these people I never knew uh, but it said to me I had to interview them we were watching a show my wife and I one day it was on Amazon Prime and it was on a Good Friday called On a Wing and a Prayer. And it's about a gentleman whose brother dies. And uh, they were at the funeral. And he chartered a plane to take him and his family back home to their hometown in Louisiana. Ten minutes into the flight, the pilot dies. He's now have to take over and land this plane. Long story short, he lands it successfully without even a scuff to the tire. And I was interviewing him. And let me tell you, this guy could be a pastor, but he's very much well-spoken. He's very, uh, he's done a lot of different, uh, uh, almost like TED Talks. 
And so I finally got in contact with him and I was asking him, I said, you know, did you feel anything that day? What was it like? And he told me, when you walk in the light, you have no fear. The angels are with you. And he felt them. And here he was. He had to land this plane. And what was interesting about it, and again, the whole story's in the book, is that when he finally made contact, you know, Mayday, Mayday, and they made contact, he made contact with somebody, I believe it was in Miami, and he says, look, find me the longest, widest runway you can, because I got to land this bird. And he's, uh, the lady said, well, we're going to reroute you over to Fort Myers. And so Fort Myers has a huge long runway. Uh, I had heard that it's also a backup runway for the shuttle, but I was not able to confirm it. Uh, but, but that's something I'm still looking at. But it was a super long runway. He only used about a fourth of it to land the plane. And I mean, just taxied it over. The, the problem he had was at the end, trying to shut the engine off. Because nobody there knew how to shut it off. And finally, uh, a pilot that was in a plane that was waiting uh, in line, they halted all planes, said, look, I know how to do that. Just let me talk to them. And they, they were able to shut the, the engine off. Uh, but the signs that he was receiving, he says, tell me when in April in Fort Myers, it's ever been as calm as it was that day. Now, the person I couldn't get in contact with, no matter how hard I tried, was Dennis Quaid, the actor. Dennis played this gentleman in the movie. And I tried, I mean, I I looked for everything I could, his agents, his alma mater, uh, any, any, his fan club, uh, anything I could find to get to Dennis. And I was not able to contact him. So I wish I could have because I uh, was listening to another podcast uh, and he was on it. Uh, Jordan Harbinger was the podcast uh, show, the Jordan Harbinger show. And Jordan's an interesting guy. You should look him up, a really interesting guy. Um well, anyways, I'm listening to him and he, he's saying how he's out in California and the fires were coming in and he had to evacuate his house. And so he evacuated and went to a motel and he was telling Jordan, he says, I was in the same room occupying the same place of the first apartment I had in uh, Hollywood at the time. And he says, talk about a sign. And I said, whoa, right there. I mean, I would have loved to talk to him um, to, to hear his story about if he felt anything while filming the show. Uh, right. But that's just some of the stories that are in there. And there's so many more. And I had friends reach out to me and tell me their stories. And I, signs are all about us. We just need to be open to seeing them, to receiving them. And they're different for everybody. Uh, as far as the message goes. But as you started, Jumi, of saying there's different ways that we can receive signs, uh, direct intervention, where there's somebody like uh, the 9-11, I talk about two gentlemen that were in the Twin Towers on 9-11. One gentleman who was uh, getting out with a group of people, he was heading for the stairwells, and there was four of them. All of a sudden, he feels somebody on his shoulder directing him towards stairwell A. Why? He looked around. Nobody's there. What was this? Well, to me, that's direct intervention. Then we talked about visitation dreams, uh, objects and smells. Uh, where, when my brother passed on, we had his funeral down in uh, Illion, New York, my hometown. And my mom had a house there. And my wife and my mom and I are sitting in the living room. And all of a sudden, one by one, undeniable cigarette smoke it just came through nobody smoked in that house none of us smoke and so we said what is that and i got up and i looked around outside nobody was there i went upstairs nobody was there here's the thing my brother smoked and my dad smoked was that the two of them there coming to visit at the time i take it as a good sign it wasn't too long later my sister does live down there too. So she stopped in to check on mom. And mom said, could you go upstairs and, and get some uh, 
you know, fabric or something. She was going to make a, a, a certain craft and her craft room was upstairs. So my sister starts heading up the stairs and the stairs make a 90 at a landing. Soon as she got to the landing, again, undeniable cigarette smoke. And so she just said, Butch, are you having fun with me today? And so her and I have talked about that. And we totally believe that was my brother, Butch. And I mean, it, it happened so quick for him that when his heart valve gave out, even the doctors have told me he was probably dead before he hit the ground and just didn't know. Um, so th there's that, there's smells, uh, asking for help and animals and numbers and things like that can all be signs. And uh, I, I've had a sign with, with, with numbers. Uh, for example, I keep seeing the number one, two, three, and one, two, three, four, no matter where I go. I, I, in fact, before I just one week before I release the book, I go and I take my car into the shop for some service. I get the bill. The tax on it was $12.34. One, two, three, four. And when I look these things up, you know, I, I keep running across something called angel numbers. And I had never heard of these things before, but I keep seeing that. And there's also numerology, but they're, they're similar, but they're not the same. But with um, angel numbers, it tells me, keep going. You're on the right path. That's what one, two, three, four means. But then also I'm coming back from guitar lessons one night and I had a car. I mean, no more than three, four feet, pull right in front of me. I'm hitting the brakes and it's still going. And of course, I'm getting ready to say a few words. But I look down for some reason at the license plate. People know me as Kevin and close friends know me as Kev. There on the license plate was K-E-V followed by four numbers. Time out. I said, okay, I get it. It's a number, another sign. So I go home and look it up. And it was another good one that says I am on the right path and don't stop. So I said, okay. I get the message. So I, I see these things and I, I didn't used to pay attention to them. But now when I look back, there's so many things from my childhood. There's so many things from my, uh, you know, my teens and later on that have happened that I just say, these are all signs. And it, it really, really convinces me that there is a hereafter and at times the veil can be thin. Uh, and in fact, uh, the Irish people talk about it as, as thin places. And I have a friend of mine who happens to be a Mormon. And he was telling me, and I, I sent the book to him early to get his uh, viewpoints on it. And he told me, he said, this is an interesting title because they're taught that when we're born, the veil is brought down over us. So we don't know what happened. We now can start our journey as human beings. And then when we die, the veil is lifted again. So he said this was very, very interesting to him. And he said his wife and his daughter have had some experiences. He has not, but uh, they have had some experiences. So I I, I, you know, I'm talking yeah. a lot, Jumi, but no, <laughs> no, no, this is this is good. And I, I want you to get your thoughts out. Uh, and I actually do want to go back and talk about some of those different categories of signs, right? Because sure. again, when you reached out and I saw the title of your book and I also read your book, I was like, this is, this is spot on, right? Like, I believe that the universe, the creator, whatever you want to call it, some people call it spirit, is constantly talking to us. And and I've always known this ever since I was little. And that's part of why I have this interest, right? Because I'm like, how do we ignore this? There's something else out there. There's something that we're constantly interacting with that we can't see, right? And hence the name of the podcast, like shifting dimensions, right? I think yes. when we are having these communications or these signs, they're coming from a different dimension that we cannot see with yes. our naked eye, but we are interacting with, right? Yes. So- I think it's important before we even dig deeper into more of the stories in the book and the different categories of signs, right? I think it's important to really talk about what is a sign, 
I think most people listening to this podcast right now, they have a sense of what we're talking about when it comes to signs. But I, I love that in your book, you kind of made a distinction. Like, I'm not just talking about like signs that you see on billboards and stuff like that, even though sometimes those yeah. could be signs, right? Yeah. Yep. But you made a distinction. And, and what is the distinction that you made in the book? Like, how would you define the signs that we're currently talking about? Well, I, I'm I'm going to hedge a little bit only to say that it is different for everybody. They each have to recognize their own signs. Now, I gave you the categories, the direct intervention all the way through animals and numbers, et cetera. But it's really an experience where you can't explain it away. It's an experience that leave you uh, with, with a feeling that, whoa, what just happened? And I think I might've described it um, or I have talked to other people about it. You know, at night when you're getting ready for bed and you're half in and half out of sleep and all of a sudden your body just jerks, it, it, it's called a hypnic jerk. And it's kind of like that feeling. Oh, excuse me. Talk about a sign. That's my cardiologist calling to remind me of the appointment. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, man. I'll tell you. But each person has these kinds of signs, but they have to look at it as, how did it make me feel? Is it just something? Oh, yeah, that was nothing. Um, really? Was it nothing? Did it make you feel calm? A lot of times the uh, visitation dreams make people feel very calm. Wake up in the morning and you just feel everything is fa fabulous. But then there's also visitation dreams. You wake up and you say, whoa, 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 what was that? It's getting you to think more. And all of this does that. You have to decide for yourself, was this just a coincidence? Was it some happenstance that happened or is this something more? And for me, now that I can look back on it, this is down in my gut. And when I say, whoa, wait a minute, it's, it's just not setting right. There's something more here. That's when I look at it and say, it's a sign. But you do have to be careful and it takes a little bit of time to recognize these things. Because some things are just coincidence. And I ask people within the book, as, the, as the, the reader reading it, are these things coincidence? Or is there something more here? But each person has to answer that for themselves. I just want to draw it to their attention. Uh, another thing that I really want to bring out for the, from this book, hope. That we have hope as a people. We have a hope as a country, as a world. There is so much more to hang on to here. And I know there's great divisions out there. I, for me, that's not how I was raised. And we had a couple of great uniters when we were growing up. Food and music. We didn't care who you were, where you were from, blah, blah, blah. Didn't make any difference. You got a little bit of food. You got some music going. We're going over and we're going to have a great time. And that's just the way it was. And if this book can help do some of that, as the one guy on the, on the plane, uh, uh, he told me upon the interview, he says, if your book can help give one person that sense of the hereafter, it has done its job. And you know, that's what I feel. And I, I talk about a story within the book, Jimmy, where it's Coach Jim Johnson, and he's coaching a basketball team. It's a high school basketball team. It happens to be Greece, Athena, Greece, New York. And that really is a suburb of Rochester, New York. Um, he had a autistic person that kept trying out for the team. The, the kid's name was Jason McElwain. They all called him J-Mac. He was like a hundred pounds soaking wet and there's no way he was going to have the skill set to make the team. But his mom came to the coach 
and said, is there something you can do? My son loves basketball and knows all kinds of things from basketball. So they created a position for him, student assistant manager. And so Jason would show up for all the games with a white shirt and tie. He was at all the practices. His job was to, and he'll tell you, to bring water to everybody, to cheer them on, give them that pat in the back, give them a little, you know, uh, uh, pep talk when they needed it, et cetera. Well, the coach decided his senior year that he was given Jason a gift. And that was to let Jason play in one game on senior night, at least suit up for the game. He would sit on the bench. It's kind of the Rudy-esque story, if you remember the, the, the movie Rudy. Um, so he had J-Mac sitting on the bench, all suited up. And the game got far enough ahead for Greece Athena that uh, Coach Jim Johnson looked down pointed to J-Mac, the crowd went wild when he jumped up. And so he came up, all, almost ran on the court, didn't even bother checking in. They had to pull him back, got to check in, go out on the court. So he goes out on the court, they feed him the ball, his first ball, air ball, missed by a mile. Second ball, a little better, but still missed. And Coach Jim Johnson said he put his hands down in his lap, kind of folded like this. And he says, I know I'm not supposed to pray at school, but Lord, if you could just let him get a basket. Well, that was it. J-Mac went on a run. Three-pointer after three-pointer after three-pointer. at the And this was with less than four minutes in the game to go. And he wound up the high score for Greece Athena that night. But that's not the end of the story. This went nationwide because there was a high school kid that was filming that night the regular person was filming was absent he was filming and the coach said i want you to get a broad angle and fill the entire team well when j mac started making these shots he zeroed in on j mac and of course that video got shown and it just went viral president george bush at the time flew into rochester to meet j mac J-Mac also goes on to beat his idol, Kobe Bryant, out for an ESPY award that year. Here it is, a, a kid, he's autistic. And, you know, this is his dream come true. And now you go online, you can find this all over the place. You can find uh, kids that were in wrestling, in soccer, basketball. I've seen it in football all across the country, all across the world, be given their shot. And I happen to know Coach uh, Jim Johnson as my kids went to Greece Athena when they were growing up, and my son was a basketball player. And this was before j Max time. But I called up uh, Coach Johnson, and I said, uh, Jim, you know, let, let's, uh, I'd like to do an interview, and I'd like to get together with you. And so I was talking to him, and I said, what do you think this means? With all of this happening, going worldwide, newspapers all over the world, Sydney, Australia had it in their newspaper. He says, it's a message of hope. And I said, whoa, that is exactly it. He's spreading hope. And what was also interesting, um, the coach told me, he says, it's rare for him to cry. But during that show, I got to be careful. I start crying here. Uh, dur during that basketball game, he's feeling a tap on his shoulder. He turns around. It's j Mac's mother. And j Mac's mother said, you don't understand, coach. You just gave my son the greatest gift he's ever had. And when you think about that, isn't that what we should be doing? how we should be to people. And I know we don't always, everything gets in the way, but that is really the message from all this. And I, I take that message into the book. The book is a book of hope, spread it out there, spread it wide as far as I can get it. 
and like uh, Doug White was the person in, in the airplane, as Doug said, if it can help one person, it's worth it. So, yes. Yes. And, you know, talking about hope, I think it really, at least how I'm interpreting hope, part of it, right? There are multiple layers, but it, it gives hope that we're not alone, right? That when people talk about guardian angels, right? Or just people looking out for us, whether it's our deceased loved ones or just, whether it's animals, whatever it is, whatever the sign is, it, it gives hope that we're not alone, right? That yes. there's yes. a purpose for why we're here. And a lot of times that purpose is is really just it's love, right? And I, I and I want to like dig a little bit deeper, but there's something in your book that you said because I think signs show us outside of like the veil is thinner than we imagine. I think there's certain things in this world that are unexplainable, right? Math and science, psychology, all of these different, um, what's the word? All of these different subjects can only go so far in terms yes. of trying to paint a picture of what reality is. And there's something that you said, um, there, there was a quote from your book. It says, in my life, one thing I have learned is that science is insufficient to explain the universe. It seems the math gets to a point where the explainable becomes unexplained. Yes. And I think you know, when it comes to these types of conversations, right, because a lot of it is subjective, the signs you perceive are going to be different from the signs that I perceive, and they're all very particular to us. But I do think that they do show some level of evidence that there's something else out there beyond this physical reality that we can all see beyond this 3D plane. And even though we might not receive the same signs, we're all receiving signs because there's so many stories that you had in the book that I could a hundred percent relate to. Right. And kind of going back to the different categories. Right. And I kind of want to go category by category because I know we've, we've talked about a lot of these stories here, but for example, with the direct intervention, mm -hmm. th this particular, these particular types of signs bring tears to my eyes. They genuinely make me want to cry. I was very emotional going through this particular um, section of the book because it's just like, wow, you know, these direct intervention stories kind of, these are the type of signs that have a profound effect on your life. They can change your life. And, yes. you know, speaking about the the, the plain um, story that you gave, I remember my dad also had a very, very significant sign one time when he was taking a plane, um, taking a flight. And before he got on the flight, um, he had a vivid dream that the plane unfortunately crashed. He saw the people on the plane and my dad's a very prayerful person. So he got up in the middle of the night, he said the rosary and he, he prayed. So he gets on the flight and he literally sees the same people he saw in his dream. He's never seen these people before. Wow. There was one particular woman that he saw walk past him, like her look and everything, because when the plane crashed, he looked up and he had seen her body, right? And even in the dream, when the plane was going through turbulence, she got up and went to the bathroom. So he saw her get on the plane and walk past him. He's never seen this woman outside of his dream. Of course, the plane hits horrendous turbulence, right? It is horrible. The woman gets up and goes to the toilet, just like how he saw it in his dream. After an hour of insane turbulence right my dad just had this overwhelming sense of peace right and eventually the plane was stabilized and they landed and whenever he tells me this story I have goosebumps and I told my dad I believe this I don't know if it's true my interpretation was you received that sign right you could have chosen not to get on the plane which you probably should have but I think you also praying shifted the outcome of what could have happened, yes. right? Yes. That's my personal belief that you yeah. you saw that and your fervent prayer saying the rosary, he prayed for hours, I believe changed the outcome of what could have happened because he basically saw everything that led up to that, right? Which yes. is crazy to think about. I mean, talk about a sign, talk about a vision is just wow. my goodness, right? Um, So 
again, the, these direct intervention signs, these signs are the most out of worldly psychic signs to me, you know, with the the 9-11 Twin Tower story with, with, with the guy who was able to get out, even after he got out, being being directed to, I think he took a trolley or a train and it yes. happened to just be leaving from a place that typically didn't leave from, yes. you know, that even though the timing was off, he was still able to make it and he was able to get back home to his family. I mean, talk about goosebumps, right? Yes, um, yes. And even the guy who was an addict, can you talk about that story a little bit? Uh, uh, yeah, the guy who yeah. was the addict and, and got the vision of an angel. Yep. And that's Ed Curry. And let me skip to the end here a little bit. If you've heard of the Carolina Reaper pepper, Ed is the one who developed that. That's in the Guinness Book of World Records as the hottest pepper. It's about 1.6 million Scoville heat units. He's outdone himself again. He has pepper X. Pepper X is about 2.4 million Scoville heat units. You talk about hot. I don't even want to be near this thing. But here's the good news. Uh, in talking to Ed, doctors are looking at that because there's elements with inside of those peppers that could possibly be used in cancer research. And if that's the case, to me, that's yet another sign of why Ed was saved. And Ed was an addict at an early age. And he'll tell you it was drugs and alcohol. And he was a functioning addict. He held down a job, but basically using everything he could to buy the next fix. Well, he winds up because of that, losing his wife in a divorce and a lot of friends didn't want to be with him. And one day it just got to be so much. He's in a, uh, a condo in uh, Michigan. And this is in January. And if you've ever been in Michigan in January, it's cold and snowy, which it was really snowy that night. As Ed describes, it's it kind of like a blizzard outside, extremely cold. But he wanted to end the pain. And that's all he could think of. How can I end this pain? He gathered up all of his drugs, all of his alcohol, put them on the table. And if that wasn't enough, and he still doesn't fully, I think, understand why he did it. He goes and he opens the front door and he opens up the windows. Maybe it was his. If the drugs didn't do it, the cold would come in and, and take care of him. But he wanted to end this pain in the worst way. So as he's sitting there, all of a sudden he sees this huge bright light at the front door. And he looks and he sees this person even brighter than the light that was uh, in back of it, in front of it. And it was a you know, a silhouette, an image. And all that image told him was go to Brighton Hospital. That's all it said. And he's looking around and there's snow coming in the front door. He gets up, he goes over, the image is gone. There's no footprints, nothing. He said, what the heck was that? But it told me to go to Brighton Hospital. I got to go to Brighton Hospital. So this is what he said. I gathered up my guns, my drugs, my alcohol. I loaded my car up and I headed out to go to Brighton Hospital. Now, he didn't know where Brighton Hospital was, but he knew where Brighton, Michigan was. And he just kind of assumed, well, that's probably where the hospital is. So while he's heading down the road, he, he got to the point to where he says, I got to stop in my buddy's house because his buddy's house was on the way. So he stops into his buddy's house and he's very excited and agitated and he said, look, I got to go to Brighton Hospital. I saw this vision, blah, 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 blah. And the guy says, OK, sit down, relax. In the meanwhile, they called his uh, mother and father and said, look, we got him here. We're going to take him to the hospital. So they get him. They put him in the car. They take him to the hospital. They get to the hospital and it's kind of like a, a building, not a, a normal hospital like you would think of with the front emergency room and all that. And there's a door, it says, you know, this is the entry. So he knocks on the door and a person opens it and all Ed in his excited way said, an angel sent me here. And the guy said, maybe you should come in and have a seat. So they invited him in, sat him down. He was still agitated. His friend had brought some whiskey. And his friend gave him the whiskey and he proceeded to down it. And 
the next thing you know, they convinced him to stay. Three days later, he's waking up and he said that he didn't really at first know where he was, but the uh, folks came in and said, you are in a rehab hospital. And he says, whoa, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And they convinced him to stay. Well, at the time, Ed was extremely overweight. Uh, I think he said he was going 400 and some pounds. Uh, I forget the exact amount, but he stayed there 30 days and he gets noticed his insurance is no longer paying. He says, well, this is really helping me. He finds a uh, apartment not too far away, about two miles. And he thought he had lost his license for some reason. So every day for the next almost three years, he walked back and forth. Well, guess what? He dropped the weight. He was back down to a little under 200 pounds. And in doing so, he became sober. As he says, I, I don't even have a desire. Either it's the, the, the vision, whatever it was, whatever touched me, took all that away. It's gone. And after that time frame, he moves to uh, South Carolina and starts developing the peppers. Now he has a pepper ranch down there. He sells the uh, uh, peppers and he makes it into spice and sells the spice. And I mean, he's hired a lot of addicts. But the thing is, you're going to remain sober while you're working here. And he's hired and everything is just going great. He's remarried. He's got children. Um, he, he's told me a couple of other stories that aren't in the book where I just sit back and I go, whoa, whoa. He has, this, had, has had signs. And the way I found Ed was I was looking, listening to a Mike Rowe podcast, you know, the Dirty Jobs guy. And, and was on there telling a story. And I said, well, I got to get in touch with this guy and find out more. And he told me a lot more. And he is just, he, he's loving life. He's back into the church, which he had left. Um, his wife uh, brought him there. And one of the other stories was his wife, it's uh, during church, it was communion day. And his wife says, come with me. Let's take communion together. And he says, no. I can't. I don't feel I'm worthy. Not yet. So his wife's walking down the aisle and the preacher who was up on the stage immediately jumps down. His wife was on the way down. She wasn't even at the stage yet. Immediately jumps down, walks back to the pew right in front of Ed and says, Ed, you're worthy. Whoa. When he told me that, you know, the hair on the back of my neck is standing up, how in that distance did it, I mean, how did he know? Again, another sign. And since then, uh, like I said, uh, Ed has children. He's adopted a couple of children. He has some interesting stories around that too, but he is just loving life right now, totally sober and been sober. And as I was telling this story on uh, another podcast, I had the lady on there say, whoa, time out. She had a very good friend of hers. And that friend was an addict. And that friend had just lost a friend of hers who was also an addict. And the friend said, I woke up one morning and I, I had come from the dream and this person came to me in the dream and happened to have been the person who died, who was the addict, and says, that's it, you're done, you're sober now, no more. She says she went into rehab at that point, hasn't even had the desire to have anything, been sober ever since. Wow. And these people, I mean, they, for the most part, addicts deal with the demons every day, every day. and for them to come to this realization and then have this burden, just the only way I can say it, cleansed from their body, that's got to tell you something. 
And I'm, I mean, I'm not one of these who uh, doesn't partake in a little bit of alcohol every now and then. I like a good whiskey. I also like a beer once in a while or a glass of wine. But I've never had the desire where I had to have it every day and, you know, wake up in the morning and that's all I'm thinking about. No, it, it hasn't been like that for me. I enjoy it with food. I, I enjoy it with friends and that kind of thing. But these folks, they live it day in and day out, 24 hours a day. And for them to all of a sudden have that burden lifted, that's got to tell you, there is, there is a great beyond that's reaching out and saying, you are worthy. Mm. You know, another thing that comes to mind too, like when I hear these stories is just that how we're all connected, right? Because like you said, these stories give the listener who's hearing about it hope. But not just that, I think about, you know, when you have such a immense change, I mean, look, he, he went out, he has this lucrative business. He's able to hire other people who struggled with addiction and help yes. them keep them clean and give them an opportunity to make a living for themselves, right? Remarrying, adopting children. I, I'm not sure what the story is, but it just seems like there's this domino effect that not only affected his life, but has affected the lives of people around him and people that yes. he comes across, yes. right? And yes. it's just amazing because a lot of times, I think these signs, again, they're for us, but they're for the greater good, the greater collective, right? Yes. We were yes. all feeding into each other. We're all pouring into the the bucket of, of love and, and unity and just evolution, spiritual evolution, I believe. So it's just so fascinating, those stories. And like you said, it, again, it just rings true that there's something in the great beyond that we need to pay attention to, right? And I, I just want to quickly go through the other um, signs one more time. End of life visitation dreams, that's a big one. We've talked about that a couple of times throughout the show already. I know I've experienced that as well when my grandmother passed. Um, objects and smells. This was a really good one. I have never had a sign related to this, but the story with your wife losing her earring that you shared at the beginning of the episode, the podcast, I was like, wow, that's that's incredible. Um, and, and the gift was from your mom, that earring, and for it to just show up the way it showed up was incredible. Um, asking for help. Can we talk about that one a little bit? Sure. Um, I, I've got a couple of stories there of things that have happened. And the first one, I go back, uh, my kids who are grown, married with children of their own, um, my oldest grandson uh, is going to be turning 17 in October. Um, when my kids were young, and I want to say they're probably five and six for the oldest, and then it would make the youngest uh, three or four. Um, I love to do work around the house. I was kind of one of these handyman types, and it didn't make any difference. I'd figure out how to get it done. And one day I needed to, my drill, and I couldn't find my chuck key. Now, for those uh, today, the chuck key probably doesn't mean anything. But back in the day, we had a little chuck key. We had to open up the chuck on the top part of the drill to stick the drill blade in and then tighten it down with this chuck key. Well, I couldn't find that no matter where I looked. And typically, I kept it in a parts drawer out in the garage. Now, the parts drawer was only nine drawers. It was probably only about yay big. Uh, yay tall, nine little drawers in it. I looked through it. My wife looked through it. We couldn't find it. We scoured the workbench, couldn't find it. Well, a few days went by and I needed it again for another project. And I went out and I looked around again, couldn't find it. And meanwhile, I'm getting frustrated. I, I do get frustrated a little bit easy on some of these things, um, but couldn't find it. Finally, one day I go back out open up the parts drawer. Well, before I get to that, I would say something in this, this is where asking for help come in. Dad and my dad had passed on before that. And my dad was always a, a worker. I helped work with him when he was building additions onto our house as a kid. I would help him out and stuff. So I said, dad, if you know where the Chuck key is, place it someplace I can find it, will you? I'm pulling my hair out here. I go out the next day open up the parts drawer, there's the chuck key sitting right there. 
I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. You looked at it to my wife. I said, you looked at it. I looked at it. We can't both be blind. But that's not the only time that happened. When I was writing my second book, my uh, Rosemont, Minnesota Memories, um, there was a picture that I knew we had. My wife knew we had. And this was during COVID. And we had laid the pictures out on the dining room table because we were going to sort through them and categor categorize them and that kind of thing. Um, this picture was the motel we stayed in, my, my family, when we first moved to Minnesota, my dad was transferred with his job. And on top of the lobby of the motel was an airplane. And it was kind of one of these iconic places you would see. And a lot of pilots stayed there. And uh, we wound up staying there for a few weeks while my family found more uh, accommodating uh, place for us to stay. And I went looking for this. I knew we had it. My wife knew we had it. Couldn't find it anywhere. And so we looked around that table. We went, I, I'd say, easily a dozen, 18 times. We could not find this picture. So I just said, Mom, Dad, because my mom had passed on at the time. Mom, Dad, Butch, if you know where that picture is, find it and put it someplace. I can find it. Well, a little bit of time goes by and I go in. I said, I'm going to look again. And I looked around and there was this picture frame sitting at the end of the table. It had been there all along. But the glass was from the frame was sitting up on top of the frame. I said, I don't remember that. And I looked inside and, you know, just looked down like this at it. And there was a stack of pictures in there. I don't remember seeing that. Now, it could have been there. I pull the glass off. I pull the stack of pictures off. I go through it. There's the picture sitting right there. That was the one I've been looking for. I go out and I show my wife and she said, where'd you find it? I said, on the dining room table. No, no, no. Where'd you find it? We looked all over that. Where'd you find it? I said, on the dining room table. We had looked and looked and looked and we could not find it. And it took me asking for some help. Now, you can ask for help. The answer may be no, but you can ask. Nothing stops you from asking. And it's different. I, I look at it different than a prayer. A, a, a prayer to me is I'm praying to God. But here I'm asking my deceased relative to help me out. And if you do believe, you go on, then they can hear. They can see. If they can help you out, I don't know. But in this case, they did. And I, I am forever grateful. And in fact, that picture, I had gone to the historical societies out there in Minnesota, and they said, we have been looking for that picture. We got one when they demolished the building, but we don't have one with the airplane on the building. I was now able to share that picture with them and they have that out there in their archives. Wow. It, it, to me, it's incredible. Yeah. It's incredible. I, all we did was, all I did was ask. Yeah. And, and, and people who know me know he's a very logical thinker. I was a computer programmer. I went into project management late in my career. I, I was one of these very logical, you know, the A plus B equals C and all this stuff. And now I'm sitting back thinking, what did I miss that I should have been more observant of? Because mm. A plus B doesn't always equal C. Mm. You know, That's there's a good one. Yeah. something else. There's, there's something <laughs> else. And, you know, I really especially loved the sign that you, you pointed out here with the asking for help. Because I remember in high school, um, I lost my binder and it was really important. It had a bunch of like assignments and, and stuff that I was working on. And I remember like kind of freaking out about it. And I think one of my teachers or maybe another student, I, I can't remember at this point, they said, say St. Anthony, St. Anthony, which is the saint that helps people find stuff. Okay. St. Anthony, St. Anthony, please come around. Something's been lost and needs to be found. And I remember saying that and literally within minutes, I found my binder. I, I it, it was 
I could not find it. So now I still say that. I guess I could just say, hey, you know, can you help me find something? I don't need to say St. Anthony, but it's something that I take from my childhood. And every time, most of the time when I, I lose something and I'm like, St. Anthony, St. Anthony, please come around. Something's been lost. It needs to be found. Boom. Like I, I find it. Right. I don't know if I'm okay. connecting to St. Anthony. It could be my grandmother, but it's just something that I'm fond of. So I, I liked, I really liked that aspect that you called yes. out the asking for help and receiving a sign or finding what you're looking for yes um okay animals and numbers I actually you've talked about this at the beginning of the podcast but I I wanted to kind of focus special attention to it because this is how I receive most of my signs and I thought it was interesting that you grouped animals and numbers together because mm -hmm. I do receive um, animal and number signs together often, but yeah. most of the time I receive more number signs and some of the numbers that you say that you, you see recurrently one, two, three, and two, 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 yes. two, two is a big one for me. 12 is a big one for me as well. One, two, three. I just started seeing recently, I would say a couple of days ago before this call, maybe that was more of like, a synchronistic aspect because I'm mm -hmm. going to be talking to you and, and that's before I read it in the book and I'm like oh wow I can't believe that's the number he sees a lot as well so and then also with animals and just a quick story about how why I'm so like a, a nerd when it comes to this particular science because there was a time when I was moving out of an older apartment and I just kind of felt really lost and really really sad right and I, throughout the months leading up to the move, I kept seeing butterflies and ladybugs, right? And at first I kind of, you know, ignored them, but then the butterfly represents transformation, inner work, mm -hmm. healing, and the ladybug represents good, good fortune, good luck, right? So I, I would see that, you know, often, and I would kind of look it up here and there, but I just remember this was the last day in the apartment. I was cleaning up, just kind of feeling like, oh my gosh, like, I don't know what's going on with my life. I don't know what's next. I, I I don't know. And the doors and the windows were closed. And I literally look up to the corner of, you know, one of the walls in my apartment and a ladybug and a butterfly were wow. nested right in the corner across from me. Mm -hmm. Never mm -hmm. saw a butterfly before in the house. Never saw a ladybug. And they were together. And it brought an overwhelming sense of peace. Like you're going to be okay. Like yes. the next chapter, you're going to be in a cocoon, but you're going to come out as a butterfly and we're with you. Luck is following you. Right. Yep. Yep. And it was just so powerful. And then, you know, throughout the years, like when I would be looking for a new job, I would see 926. That number has a frequency of financial gain. That's, wow. you know, when I, when I looked it up and I was like, oh my gosh, I, I think I'm going to get a new job. Before I started my podcast, I kept seeing 1111, which is being in, you know, in alignment with your soul purpose, mm -hmm. et cetera. So I can go on and on and on. But <laughs> a lot of the things that you were talking about, I was like, yes, I can resonate with it. And I just want you to share your hummingbird and butterfly story because that was very touching. Sure. Uh, I'll go back just a little bit further and, and talk about the cardinal uh, the, the cardinal bird a lot is said to be a messenger. Now, a lot of folks will talk about when one of their loved ones die, they see a cardinal show up. And the uh, cardinal's red color is said to be that way because of the touch of the divine, the blood of Christ, and the uh, red color signifies that. It goes on across cultures, it goes on across countries, uh, the Iroquois or just Indian lore itself, they uh, coveted the cardinal feather as much as they did the eagle feather because they viewed that this was, you know, one of the past warriors and they would put it into their headdress and wear it into battle, uh, figuring, you know, it gave them that much more strength. Um, but to get to hummingbirds and butterflies i got called into the garage one day now i have a three-car garage and all the garage doors were open and my wife calls she says uh, honey you got to come out here and see this so i go out there and we've got you know garage door openers and the wire goes across the ceiling a hummingbird had landed on the wire and was just perched there 
And I'm thinking, how do I get this hummingbird out of the garage? Well, I did some research later on because I did not know this, but hummingbirds, usually when they're frightened, they'll shoot up. So I said, how am I going to do this? He can't shoot up. There's the, the ceiling. So I get a broom and I go up and I put it bristle side up and the hummingbird steps onto it. I bring him down. I walk him out. He flies back in. Oh boy, go back in and do it all over again. But this time when he gets on the bristle, I bring him down and I take my finger and go right up along the bristle and he steps on it. And I walk him out. And this time I walk him out further into the yard. And we're just sitting there like this, looking at each other. And it was so calm, so peaceful. It seemed like it was, you know, hours, but it was just mere seconds. And we're just looking at each other. And all of a sudden, then he flies away. And I'm thinking, whoa, that was an interesting experience. And I didn't think a whole lot about it until just a few days later, my wife and I had finished up the chores and we're sitting on the back deck and we we're probably having a adult beverage and just relaxing and enjoying our uh, land that we have. And all of a sudden we see a butterfly fly past us. Well, it flies past and all of a sudden it does a circle and comes over and lands on my shoulder. I'm sitting there on the deck chair and I got, I'm looking like this. Here's this butterfly looking at me. I have to, what in the world am I, you know, am I now Dr. Doolittle? Did the hummingbird tell the butterfly, hey, he's a good guy, <laughs> you know, go see him. But afterwards I looked up and there's special meaning to hummingbirds. There is special meaning to butterflies. Hummingbirds even have a meaning down to, depending on the culture, to the color of their wings. And I'll give you one other story. I don't know if you know of the actress Suzanne Summers. I've was, heard of that name, but yeah. I can't place the face at the moment. Mm -hmm. Well, she, she had passed on, but she was in a show long ago called Three's Company. Um, and uh, John Ritter was her... Uh, uh, one of one of the other uh, actors in the show. Well, Suzanne Summers passed on, and her husband Alan. He was not a believer in the afterlife. He he come right out and tell you he's not a believer. Until things started to happen around his house, things that he couldn't explain, and one day he's opening the door to leave. A hummingbird flies in, flies all around the kitchen, the other room, and then finally goes to the living room, lands on a picture of him and Suzanne. And when he started thinking about it and said, look, with this and everything else, that's her coming to me some way, somehow to let me know everything is okay. And he has now been out in public and stating that he is a firm believer. He has no other way to describe it. And so the, the butterfly story, the hummingbird story, they're personal to me. I don't know, and I, 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 I didn't really know what message necessarily they were bringing to me. All I know is I felt a feeling of peace. And maybe that's all it needed to be. And sometimes that is all it is. Just to let you know, relax a little bit. Everything is okay. He has it in control. Mm. And that's all I needed to know. Yeah. But these stories are out there all over. And other people have other stories. Uh, one of the, another gentleman I was talking to, his mom passed away. But in the, the hospital room, he noticed a cicada, a cicada bug. And it just happened to be sitting there. Well, a few days later, you know, he's thinking about his mom and everything. And he's walking. All of a sudden, a cicada bug came and hit him right in the chest. And he, he just told me, he says, he, he, he said, Mom, I get the message. Everything is okay. 
And to him, that's all it needed to be. And to me, maybe it's something, maybe it's not. But if it gave him that peace, who are we to argue with it? Yes. That was his personal sign. Mm. So I that, love that you... Go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I, I was just going to say that I love that you are emphasizing that sometimes the signs are just reassurance and they're here to offer us peace. Because I think sometimes people think these signs have to be loud and they have to be life-changing and they have to be just so obvious and they have to mean something so deep. And sometimes, a lot of times, they just mean we're with you. Yes. We're we're guiding you. There's hope. You're not alone. You're okay. Yes. And, you know, because I see numbers all the time. And at some point I'm like, oh my gosh, like I'm getting all these numbers all the time. What does it mean? And I've realized that certain numbers pop up, pop up, pop up for me when I'm thinking about something specific. So I know, okay, this is a direct message. But a lot of times the repeating numbers that I see are just, I believe, spirit letting me know that we're with you. Yep. We have your back. Everything's okay. You're protected. You're loved you're worthy. And I think that's very important that you, you highlighted that. Yeah. And, and that's the way I see it too. Um, I work out on the treadmill almost daily. I didn't today because otherwise you'd see me with drenched hair. And, you know, um, but I'll be walking along and there's readouts on the uh, treadmill and it has pulse rate and it has your, your speed and how many miles you went and the time and all this kind of stuff. So I look down and every once once in a while, there it is, 1234. Or I look down again, I've done 1.23 miles. Why? Am I am I clued into seeing that or something causing me at that point to look down? Because the TV's in front and I'm trying to, you know, get involved with whatever show that's on so that I don't feel the burn from the, you know, walking on the treadmill. But all of a sudden it just tells me. And it's the same numbers, one, two, three, or one, two, three, four, and there it is. And to, to the point, even my wife, I'll, I'll show her and she'll just go, yep, and she'll shake her head yeah. because she, she realizes it too and sees this. And let me tell you, she just had a very, very interesting experience. And the lady that I, I told you early on had passed away, a um, good friend of ours, um, she was the one that found or that uh, placed the cardinal on the kitchen island for the earring. Well, we just got a, a dog not too long ago. She's still a bit of a puppy, uh, be nine months uh, in another few days. And so my wife, my daughter, son-in-law and their family took a trip down to, and I probably butcher the name, Chicotec Island where the horses go across um, and they were down there for that. And the first day she loses her earring. Well, in the meantime, two days go by and they're in two different hotels. And the third day she's in the bathroom and she happened to be at the right angle. There's the earring. And it just dawned on her right away. Okay, Louise. I get the message. And Louise was the one who passed away. Louise was the one who was there with the cardinal charm. And she knew, my, my wife knew that that would be a way that Louise would give her the message. Now, as my wife said, the earring could have got into the travel case, but why didn't she see it all these times? And now it was sitting out in plain sight on the counter in the third hotel she was at. Wow. Now you got to, you got to call time out. You and have you just to call time out. Yeah. yeah. It's incredible. So. And, 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 you know, there's one more story that I want us to kind of end with before I ask other questions. Sure. Um, And that is the 747 story about the women who won the lottery. Oh, yes. That was a fun one as well, yes. where you have to call time out. Right. And I think the audience is going to enjoy the story because I think so many people believe that one day they might win the lottery. So if you yeah. could share the story, that would be awesome. Well, the, the lady had worked at a uh, Boeing out in Washington and she goes in the lottery was way up and she goes into the lottery and she sees the amount of the money was $747 million. 
dollars. And she says, oh, I might as well take a shot on it. She takes a shot. Sure enough, she wins. The airplane that she worked on while she was at Boeing was the 747s. So to hear the story, and I know I'm not doing it justice here, but in the book, I go into much more detail around it. But to hear that story, it brought me back to a friend of mine, Joel. Uh, his wife hit a scratch off for a million dollars. And when I went and I visited Joel, they have the big check hanging up in, in the uh, stairwell going down to his uh, finished basement. And I said, whoa, Joel, that has to be fantastic. He says, well, let me tell you, she, his wife, has not only hit that, she has hit a number of them. And all of a sudden we hear, ah, from the living room. So we both go in. I am not kidding you. I saw it with my own eyes. She had a scratch off for 15000 Now, Joel tells me that this is her hobby and she spends easily 100 bucks a week on this. But that's not the story. When I went into the living room, I started looking around. All kinds of angel statues. I mean, every made out of wood, made out of porcelain, any material big, you know, small, whatever, all over. And Joel told me that is the only spot she would go to and sit and do the scratch-offs. Is there something more there? Um, I'm, I'm not here to say, go buy a bunch of these angel statues and get yourself some scratch-offs. No, 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 no. But for her, it has to mean something. There has to be more to it. Why does she keep hitting them? Is it just the numbers in play? But if it is, uh, you know, she's scratching off hundreds of tickets, but to hit the million, the 15,000, and Joel's has told me he she's had a number of 5,000, not to mention the $10, the $20, etc. She is constantly winning. Why? But she'll only do it in that living room. That's amazing. Well, you know what? We, we've heard so many stories that you shared throughout the episode, and I've shared some stories. Some people might be listening and thinking, sounds like a coincidence. I personally, I'm at a point in my life where I don't believe in coincidences. I think everything serves a purpose. A lot of times we might not even know what that purpose yes. is. Yes. And we have to be okay with that. But I, I don't believe in coincidences right? Personally. So what would you say to people who are saying, mm, that just seems like a coincidence? Doesn't, and I'm not, I'm not just talking about the lottery, for example, I'm talking yeah, about, yeah. for example, your, your wife finding her earring, you know, in, in the hotel, that could yeah. be a coincidence, right? So what would you say to people who, who might feel like some of these things are just coincidences? My, my first thought was how often can coincidences happen? Mm. And if they're constantly happening in your life, Shouldn't you take a step back and question it? I know I would. And I'm not to say there's no coincidence. There are coincidences out there. But then how did it, having that happen, how did that experience make you feel? Is there something deeper to this? And I mean, I, I've had a few things happen and okay, I didn't think much about it and it didn't have any real impact to me. It was just kind of coincidence. But was it coincidence when that car pulled right in front of me with that license plate with my uh, abbreviated name on it? I mean, I've driven that road many times and he cut me right off. I mean, he had plenty of room. He came right in front of me and the license plate clears day, KEV and the set of numbers. Is that coincidence? It meant something to me. So I don't think it was. The butterfly circling, people may say, that was coincidence. Yeah, we got hundreds of butterflies in our backyard. Why did that one circle around, then come over to the deck and land on my shoulder? You know, you got to ask these questions. And again, it could come down to, yeah, it just happened. It's nature. Strange things happen in nature. Okay. Okay. Um, if that's how you feel, but it made me feel differently. It made me feel at peace. And to me, I've taken that as a sign 
And if that's all it meant to do was get me at peace, then it did its job. So I can't answer it clearly for everyone. I can just give you some guidelines. If you feel that these are happening more often than not, and you feel there's something more about it, then I would say you might be receiving a sign and you should look a little deeper. You should try to explore it further and ask these questions. Go online. There's a wealth of knowledge out there. But don't just take one source. I will tell you right now, there's also a lot of garbage out there. You've got to keep looking and get to some really good sources uh, to find if there is more than that. If you are religious, talk to your clergy and ask them, this is what happened. Is this something I should be thinking about, concerned with, etc.? But just remember, in the cases where you ask, sometimes the answer is no. And you have to be okay with that because there's a bigger, greater plan. Mm. And, and at least that's my belief and how I feel about it. And, and like I started uh, it off, uh, Jumi, I'm, I'm not extremely religious. I'm not a Bible reader every day. I'm not a go to church person every day. But I do believe in the Almighty. And I do hope to God that I will be saved and go up and be with the rest of them. And that's all we can do. It's hope. And I'll go back to the book and just say, I hope it brings a little bit of hope to everybody that there's something more out there beyond it. Let's get away from all the noise that's going on and let's get back in touch with our own spirit. Let's get back in touch with our inner being. Let's get back in touch with people because that's why we're here. That That's my belief anyways. That's that's how I feel. Yes. It's interesting. You, you mentioned um, drowning out the noise. And as you were talking, the, the first thing that popped into my head, one of the things that popped into my head is just, I think these signs force us to pause really yes. and kind of think and reflect and pay attention. Like, hmm, yes. what is that about? Because I think we are spiritual beings having a human experience. And sometimes we forget the spirit part of this experience and focus on the human day-to-day -day things. And I think a lot of times this is like, pause, take a deep breath and mm -hmm. think, reflect, go into your inner landscape, your inner world. And then the other thing that came up for me as you were talking is the releasing of fear. I mean, there's so many themes in the book, right? Hope is one of those things. But one thing that came across for me was there's nothing to fear. Life can have unexpected turns and there could be things that could pre be perceived to be scary, but there's no, you don't have to stay in that frequency, right? right. There's right. nothing to be afraid of. And oh. even when you're having these supernatural experiences, there's, you don't need to be afraid, right? No, um, no, you don't. There, there's something you talk about in the book because, you know, you have so many stories about having communication with deceased loved ones and so many people have stories about that and they can relate to it. And there's something you said in the book that it's kind of, death is kind of like a paradox, right? Because you're leaving your human body, but then you're being woken alive in the spirit, right? <laughs> so it's like, we know that even though people are no longer in their human shell, their energy, their essence, their spirit lives on, yes. right? And we are yes. contacting them. They're contacting us all the time. So which, you know, led you to say that you're not necessarily afraid of death, but I kind of want to dig deeper a little bit into your thoughts on what you think the purpose of life is, right? Because why are we here? Because I, I, I think there's physical death, but I don't actually believe that we die, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, we've kind of been touching on that with the veil being thinner. So why do you think we're here? You kind of alluded to it, but if you could go a little bit deeper. Okay. Uh, but as you were saying that, you re you just reminded me, I actually, uh, in, in eighth grade science, we had a teacher, Mr. Ellis. And if the uh, exercise for the day was done, he would just say, look, we've got five, 10 minutes left. Why don't we just open it up to Q&A? Anybody got questions on anything? And so I asked him a question one day, which was what you just asked. Why are we here? Why do we live when we're only going to die? 
So at the time, you know, being the teacher he was, he says, there's a real good book on the subject. I said, oh, great. What is it? He says, the Bible, go read it. <laughs> What's his answer? Uh, but how do you answer such a deep question? And I think we're here. And when you really think about it, you know, I, I hear all the time, God, family, country. And in that order purposely, we're here to serve, but not, first we're here to serve him, but we're also here to serve family and we're here to serve country. So if that's the reason we're here, then the purpose becomes, how can we serve? What do we do? How can we be, for my case, how can I be a better husband to my wife? How can I be a better father to my kids? How can I be better in God's eyes? And how can I serve my country better? Now, serving the country that at my age, obviously I'm not going to go in the military, uh, but I could put the flag out. I, I can help maybe at um, veterans places and things like that to help those who help keep this country going. For family, I already mentioned some of those. And for God, can I, this book, was this a way to serve, to bring these messages out, the message of hope? So I, I'm still, we're all on a journey. We're all on an individual journey, and I'm still on my journey. So a direct answer to the question, I can't give you one, but I can say each person has to find their purpose. And to me, when I think of God, family, country, that helps me align better and look at what those purposes could be or are. Yes. And speaking of purpose, you know, it's a question, even though I ask, I think about all the time. And, you know, I've had so many guests on the show give me different perspectives. And the one that rings true to me the most is the fact that I think we're here to learn and experience. And for a while I used to sit with that and I'm like, learn and experience. What, why would we want to learn and experience hardship, but also love and bliss and enjoyment and excitement, right? Why, mm -hmm. what, what is the purpose of that? You know, if we're these spirit beings, cause a lot of people say that once we live our physical body, we live, we leave a, a, all of the heaviness, right? We, we yes. leave the yes. ailments, we leave the so, um, mental distress, all of the stuff that holds us down in this physical world we leave we le leave that and we feel more at bliss we're free we're not burdened with any of that so I'm like if, if we start off there then why come here to have those experiences right mm -hmm. and I've as I've been going through my life my short-lived life so far hopefully I have many more years decades I realize that there's certain things in my life too that I find myself seeking because I want to experience mm -hmm. whether on a subconscious level, what that actually feels like. And it could be something as mundane as I want to start a new exercise regimen just to see, even though my, my body might go through some physical pain as my body's trying to adjust. I just want to feel what that feels like. Right. Mm -hmm. And experience that because that's how you learn. Yeah. And that's something that has like rang true to me. Right. And I think the purpose of why we're here too is so that we can be in communion and connection with each other. Right. Yes. We all have different experiences, but it's like, how can we find our way back to unity? Even though we all look different, we all have different experiences. We all have different backgrounds, but we're, we're all so interconnected and we're not separate from each other. Right. That was a lot yeah. there, but that's something else that I've, I've come to realize thus far and it's always shifting it, 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 again if you go back and i don't care uh what religious book you look at yes it all talks about love for one another and it goes back to when i was a, a child and you learned the golden rule do unto others like you want them to do unto you i'm your friend i want you to be friendly to me too but you mentioned something supposedly when we uh, pass on we leave all of that burden all of that behind well they may not always be true and the reason i say that and i learned it by uh doing the research for the book 
the difference between purgatory and hell. And I always associated the two together, just different names for the same place. Not so from the readings that I've done. Purgatory was meant to be a place that if you still have those burdens, you go to purge and you have your guardian or whatever. It could be a guardian angel. It could be uh, one of your relatives that pass on. But as a guardian spirit, help you with that process to get rid of all of that so that you can then move on. And if you remember in the movie Ghost with Patrick Swayze, I, he was kind of that in between. But when he finally did everything at the end for his girlfriend, the light opened up and he was able to move on. I mean, he had unfinished business and he was able then to get everything set to move on. And that's kind of how I view it. If you still have things and it's unfinished, this gives you that spot to move on to. And my mom had told me a story a long time ago that when you die, your spirit, soul, whatever you want to call it, walks the earth for three days. And I never understood why. And I did research and I can see it goes back to uh, in the Talmud, they talk about it. In the Bible, they talk about it. When folks were buried then, they viewed that three days, if the person didn't come back, then they were officially dead. That is why Jesus stayed for three days and then rose on that third day is because then they said, oh, no, there's no doubt about it. They were dead. Um, so maybe it goes back to that. I don't know. I never got an answer from mom when I would ask her as to why she thought that. But it comes up uh, quite a number of times, at least in the research that I was doing. And it goes back in, in uh, society, back to uh, even the Egyptian, Egyptians had uh, some ruling like this. Uh, by the way, the Egyptians not only had the Book of the Dead, they had the Book of the Dreams. And that book does exist, and it's in a British museum. Um, and so they interpret a lot of things from dreams. And back to the Roman Empire, if you, as a citizen, had a dream about the Roman Empire, you were under law to go to the nearest forum as soon as you can and tell as many people as you could about that dream because they thought it was a way that it could help protect the empire. That's how much they believed in these things. Wow. And I think over time, we've lost a lot of that. Um, go down to uh, my buddy who just lost his wife. And this just kind of dawned on me. Um, there's a preserve down in Naples, Florida, and that's where they live, um, called the Corkscrew. And it's like three miles of raised walkway that you can walk through, and you're, you're kind of like in different ecosystems. Uh, you're in kind of plains a little bit where you can look out, and then there's big cypress trees ahead, and it's kind of dense forest in a little bit Everglades-ish, and they have alligators and mountain, or not mountain lions, but lions. They, they have all kinds of animals down there. As we were walking through, we spotted a branch hanging over. They had this little green uh, fruit on it about this big. And my buddy, he says, I've been down on this thing many times because that happened to be one of his wife's favorite places to go walk. I have been on this boardwalk many, many, many times, and I have never, ever seen that. We go back and we look it up. It's called by many names, but one of them is the swamp apple or the alligator apple. It, and it goes by different names like that. But if you think about it, it's an apple. And it is ed edible. But then let's go back and say, what is the genesis of the apple? That's from the tree of knowledge and Adam and Eve. It was this also Louise's way of saying, it's all real. Everything is real. And don't worry about it. You will see it one day. I will tell people I'm anxious, but I'm not anxious to die. <laughs> I really want to see it, but I'm not anxious to go. So just, that is just... funny. <laughs> um, you know, it's so interesting because, you know, some people will say that 
hell doesn't exist. I, I, I've listened to an extensive amount of near death experiences yes. and the majority of them say that when they went to the other side, they realized hell didn't exist. Some people have an experience of hell, right? Mm -hmm. But it's a smaller yes. percentage. But then there's also this thing in hermetic philosophy that says that we live in a mental universe. And a lot of the experiences that we experience, we kind of curate ourselves. Like another example of that would be if you have a lot of hate in your heart, for example, a lot of the people you come across will mirror that back to you. Yes. So yes. you could have two people who are walking side by side, interacting with the same people. One person sees all the people that they're interacting with as hateful. And then the other person sees them as loving or neutral, right? So it's kind of like we're constantly creating our reality. And I've also heard that when people pass on, sometimes they don't realize that they've passed or because of some of the, the traumatic things that they experience in their life or they're struggle, struggling with forgiveness, they might not realize that they have the ability to release those things. So it's, there's so many layers and I do want to have someone on the podcast to come talk more extensively about it. But that was a very interesting point that you made in my personal journey at the moment. I don't believe in a hell, but do I think people can create that reality for themselves? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But I, I don't necessarily believe it's this place where someone is like, you have to go here, right? Um, which goes into my whole philosophy on on what I think God is and the the true nature of God because everybody has their own perspective. Yeah. Um, so it's it's all very all very fascinating. And like you, I'm like I, I, you know, ingest a lot of or digest a lot of this information. But I am not anxious to find out. I'm just gonna you know <laughs> get the information through the people who've had the experiences. And for those that come back and tell us amen to you. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm with it, you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, and that was one thing I didn't purposely look for to include in the book was near death mm -hmm. experiences. Uh, there are a number of them out there. Uh, and each one is similar, but yet a little bit different. And yes. some of them say I, I rose up and I looked down over my body and there I laid and that's the summation of their experience and others said no i i saw this image and it was bright and all this and it spoke to me and when i came back this is what i gotta do mm -hmm. and still another one i saw uh, the lady was actually semi-conscious and she was writing stuff down and when you look at what she wrote and it kind of looks a little gibberish but you can make out jesus i mean it's there so you, you've got to ask yourself, is this stuff real? I mean, I know how I believe, but everybody is on their own journey. Absolutely. And I could no more tell you, Jumi, that this is the journey you should go on than you could tell me or tell your next door neighbor or whatever. We all have to go through it ourselves. And, you know, like I said, I I'm, I'm in no rush, <laughs> but I, I am you know, looking forward to seeing the other side. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, if, if you're listening, I really encourage you to go read um, Kevin's book. Again, Signs, the Veil is Thinner Than We Imagine. We talked a lot about some stories here, but there's so many more stories. And like we've talked about throughout the whole episode, you're going to gain a lot of hope from this book, a lot of perspective. And I'm sure that there's so many things that you can relate to as well in, in your personal story because I do believe that we all receive signs thank you Kevin so much for stopping by shifting dimensions before I let you go I have to ask have you shifted in perspective on anything recently and it could be as lighthearted or as deep as you would like it to be as much as I'm still sad for people who lose loved ones I'm also a little bit, I guess, maybe jealous that they're going on this journey ahead. And I take comfort in that. So I think that's part of, uh, I, I think, the shifting for me. Um, I, I still get sad. I, I still get a little upset. Why them? Why now? But that's not our call. And if they're 
taking them, they have a mission and they're out of pain and they're going to a phenomenal uh, place and journey, then Godspeed to them. And one day I really do hope to meet back up with them. So it may not be a huge shift, but it was enough of a shift for me to take me from the pain side to a little bit more the hopeful and peaceful side. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's an amazing shift. And and, and that's a shift that um, I hope to get to one day. I'm, I'm fortunate. I've, I've lost my, well, not fortunate on this part, but I've lost my uncle and I've lost my um, grandparents. But I, I haven't had any losses that are earth shattering aside from my uncle you know but mm -hmm. my grandmother she was older my other grandparents I wasn't too close to them so I haven't really lost someone that's been super close to me but part of why I'm having these conversations is because you know it's not like I'm expecting to lose anyone anytime soon and by God's grace I have many more years with my loved ones but I'm trying to get ahead of that and not be afraid to have these conversations because people are and grief is such a huge thing for people so your shift, I think, is huge, and I'm sure a lot of people can relate as well. Thank you so much. Where can people find you if they want to get your book or just learn more about you? Uh, Jumi, my website is kevin-hall, that's H-A-L-L, dot com. Um, there's links there to my books. The books are also available on many online uh, bookstores. And by the way, I did for the 4th of July because I am patriotic. I do put my books on sale during that time. They are on sale right now. Uh, go look them up. They're also in libraries. And with my last book, the science book here, I set it up so that any library in the country could order it. Um, and uh, all you need to do is ask at your library if they have it, if they could get a copy of it in. Um it, it's just a way for me to continue spreading that hope around. And I do wish people, uh, you know, much, much love on their journey. It is a journey of discovery that we, uh, we each have to go through. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Kevin, for stopping by Shifting Dimensions. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Same here. I really enjoyed it.